the risk that comes when building AI agents and bringing them into the workforce, then how can enterprises solve them? Now, as soon as you allow agents to make choices, there will be conditions under which they will make long choices. Three questions need to be answered. Is it easier for me to do my job? Do I do a better job? And does that create value for the organization? Welcome to MLDS 2025. I have Rahul Bhattacharya with me from EY. And I attended his session and it was very interesting about how you spoke about the risk that comes when building AI agents in the, and bringing them into the workforce. So can you elaborate on it a little bit about what are the risks and how can enterprises solve them? Yeah, hi. Thank you. First of all, uh, yeah, Mohit, thank, thank you, so you yeah. for um, uh, giving us an opportunity and giving me an opportunity to speak here. So uh, here's the thing that you have to remember that Agent by definition is right. as agency. Yeah. And what does that word mean, agency? It is the ability to choose. Yeah. Take uh, actions. Take by action itself. and make a choice about decisions and actions. Now, as soon as you allow um, agents to make choices, there will be conditions under which they will make wrong choices. Okay. Yeah. So agent. So agent implies agency, but agency implies risks. risks. Yeah. Right. And whenever the risk comes into the picture, that means some bad decisions are being made. Yeah. So you have to take steps either to prevent, which is often not possible because you don't even know from yeah. before what mistake might happen, but at least to observe while it's happening. Yeah or at least to know after the fact that it has happened. Okay. So I'll give you an example, right? So um, we keep thinking of LLM agents, but there have been agents, AI agents operating for a long time. So your autonomous vehicle yeah. is an example yeah. of an uh, AI agent or a collection of AI agents that are so continuously monitoring the environment, yeah. observing the environment and taking an action in terms of different things they can do to drive the car or stop the car or change lanes or yeah. give signals or things like that. I think that. you also give an example about a flight as well, like 80% <clears throat> yeah, of the yeah. operations. Yeah. So uh, any um, uh, modern commercial uh, airplane today, 80% of the work is being done by not necessarily AI agents, but control systems, right? Yeah. There are... Um, uh, percepts and actuators, right? There are sensors yeah. and actuators which take action. Um, but right. even there, on any flight, there are at least two human beings sitting and watching it. Yeah. Right? That observation is very important. Why? Because the stakes are so high. Yeah. Right? We also that know that they might have listened, like for LLMs. They, they, they might. might yeah. yeah. So the, a wrong decision might happen under a given condition. Yeah. Right. Um, similarly, uh, in a car, when the autonomous vehicle was first launched, there used to be one human being in each car all the time. Yeah. Ready to take over. Yeah. Or, or ready to take an action or observing exactly what is doing, what is correct, what is not correct, yeah. which might be little incorrect, but we need to still fix that. Now it has gone to the stage where um, there might be a control center. Right? Where there's yeah. a group of people watching a fleet of cars. Yeah. Right? There's still observation, but it's not like one person in one car kind of observation. Like how Waymo is operating. Right. Yeah, yeah. right. So similarly, when we are letting agents act with agency, depending on the stakes, remember airline, airplane, yeah. very high stake. Yeah. Right. So depending on the stakes, depending on the policies and procedures of the company, and depending on the regulatory framework and the laws of the land, yeah, those are coming under up which well. you are operating as an organization and an enterprise. Yeah, you need to determine the level of observation that you have. Okay. Right. So, so when as soon as someone talks about all these AI agents and they're doing work, the common question that comes up is, what will we do then? The one, so you gave an example that there are two people who are operating an aircraft. But what about the people, developers and all these people? Yeah. So, um, you're right that the amount of the current kind of work that we do will potentially reduce. Yes. So, one thing, obviously, if we get more productive, you get more done. Right. So, you can do so much more. Yeah. And any economic activity creates economic benefits. 
So the more economic activity you can perform with the same set of people, the more uh, efficient we'll be yeah. as, a, as a country, economy, as a world. But there are also new kinds of jobs which are coming up. Okay, right? yeah. So one is, as a human a workforce's ability to perform a task is based on common on general knowledge, is based on knowledge that is picked up in school and university and then on the job knowledge which is often knowledge that is either written down in policies and procedures okay. or in the mind of the people. So that's why when people join, we take them through a training. Why are we bringing them through a training? Because there are some seniors who can tell them how to do their job. Yeah. Now that how to do their job part that they are training them on, that is on, oftentimes in their mind. So there are, there is a new class of people who will be knowledge harvesters. So that's a new job. Okay, so they'll be overseeing all these AI agents and giving... No, they'll be making sure that the knowledge required by the AI agents okay. is easily available to them, okay. is updated in an ongoing manner, is digitized and in a database somewhere that they can use. They call the unstructured data, they have to have structurized. A lot of our knowledge, A, first of all, if it is in somebody's mind, it has to be harvested. And it has to be put down explicitly. So implicit knowledge, which is in people's minds, has to be become explicit knowledge, which is written down. So then what advice would you give Raul to all the people, all the developers coming out of college? So uh, they have to become familiar with how to use the AI based tools. Okay. They have to become comfortable working with colleagues who are, some of them are human, some of them are not. Okay. That is going to be very... Yeah, it is an interesting change, right? Because, and being able to deal with the uncertainty, right? Because uncertainty often creates anxiety, but we have to train ourselves to be that how do we safely and usefully yeah. utilize an artificial agent yeah. to A, enable us to do our job better and make it easier for us to do our job. Yeah. Well, yes. end of the day, any AI system and whether it's Gen AI, agents, whatever. See, throughout my career and I've got close to 30 years of experience working in this field, there are two things that are very necessary for any AI project to um, be successful. One is data. The second is user adoption. User. So we have talked about the data part. Now let's talk about user adoption. Because what you're talking about, the developers, what will we do? Yeah. You become the end user. Yeah. All these days you are thinking of yourself as yeah. I'm developing a system for somebody else. That's yeah. the end user. Now suddenly you are the end user. So for you, three questions need to be answered. So when I say AI adoption by end users, three questions need to be answered. Take them more. Is it easier for me to do my job? <laughs> do I do a better job? And does that create value for the organization? Yeah. Right? yeah. Then and only then will user adoption go up. Definitely. So on the flip side as individuals, you have to constantly give feedback saying, is it becoming easier to do it? Am I doing a better job? So why not? If you have something that lets you do a better job, do it faster and yeah. easier, why not? In, yeah, even if there are risks, we will definitely manage them somehow. And so the frameworks are also the coming up, the orchestration yeah. like you were talking about earlier. So I'll certainly try to, not so certainly try to plug in MLDS over here. So how do you think MLDS and AIM or Cypher, all these events helping in this adoption when it comes to developers? Absolutely. I think, you see, um, India is the powerhouse of technology development because and within that AI ML development India is a powerhouse the rest of the world the thinking is there often but the work that is getting done is only with hyperscalers most of the people you know see where is the concentration of talent it's mostly you have to think of it so the concentration of AI and ML talent is in hyperscalers and software companies. Yeah. Enterprises, when they need to use AI and ML, they often don't find the talent in their market in yeah. other countries, especially yeah. in you know, advanced economies in first world countries, North America, yeah. Western Europe. 
um, Japan, places like this. So that's when they look for capacity and capability in these fields in India. That's and the actual implementation of business enterprise systems with AI and ML, the work is being done in India. Yeah. And MLDS is a conference which allows people to come and network, to share their work. We all learn from each other. Yeah. So, I, how did I start my talk today? You saw yeah. how I started my yeah. talk. Right? Yeah. Definitely, I think. One year back, there yeah. are things that we were talking about over here. Yeah. Which now they have also changed completely. We are talking about LLMs generative AI, and now the adoption is finally happening as well. So yes, I think it's great to have you for MLDS as well because people are also rushing towards asking questions to you after the talk as well. So I think thank you so much, Rahul, for joining us at MLDS, and please keep building AI at EY as well. Absolutely, thank you, Mohan. Thank you so much.